actually represent um, player unions and athletes associations. So I do feel strongly collect, uh, connected to this to this topic, and I'm really looking forward to to the presentation and then hopefully very interesting discussion. So we're gonna hear from our four panelists who will present each for ten minutes, and then we will have a um, question and answer um, debate until uh, one o'clock, and then we will go to lunch. Um, all right, so. I think without uh, further ado, I would like to ask uh, Juha Karneva to come um, to talk about, um, about his presentation entitled How an Athlete's Ethical Decision Got the Federation to Rethink Its Values. Thank you, Paulina, uh, my good friends. Uh, first, I have to apologize for my bad English. Uh, I had the same teacher as former one writer Kimi Raikkonen. Uh, <laughs> uh, he's very famous uh, from his uh, one word sentences. However, I try my best. Football players or soccer, as you say here in the United States, uh, players from Finland hit headlines in international media, very rarely. Uh, last winter, we had an exception as uh, Rico Riski, an attacking midfielder from Helsinki Club, Hojiko, got global attention because of his refusal to play in Qatar. because of, quote, the ethical reasons and values I wanted to add to the bomb. As he said in a newspaper, Helsinki Sanoma. Uh, the player didn't want any publicity for his decision, and he gave no further in, uh, interviews about the cases. So he, he was not seeking any fame or uh, publicity. Uh, as we know, as we know, uh, Qatar has hosted several famous soccer clubs after its successful purchase of the World Cup 2022. Uh, the Football Association of Finland 
had received and accepted an offer from a German company to organize a training camp and two international games in Doha. Uh, and the uh, Finland national team decided to go there. Uh, but unlike many other athletes, uh, Riku Riski didn't want to give his support to the authoritarian government of Qatar with its poor human rights record. After his decision, the head coach of the Finland national team, uh, who has, by, by the way, the same surname as I have, uh, he's Marko Kanen, not related, uh, he said that he respects uh, players' reasoning and it was okay. But the president of the Finnish uh, Association of Football, Ari Lahti, didn't meet players' decision with sympathy. He said that national team activities are voluntary, nobody can be compelled to play there, but from an ethical perspective, it feels strange that I am here in Doha with the Nordic, Nordic delegation and with the Nordic trade union leaders who were inspecting the working conditions in Qatar. Uh, we are here growing attention to the same issue as Riku, he said, and added, in that sense, Riku's decision seems silly. Uh, which raised some eyebrows in Finland and in Nordic countries as well. Uh, at the same time as the Nordic soccer leaders inspected working conditions at stadiums in Doha, uh, Riski got huge attention around the world in Nordic countries and in, in, in Europe as well, even in, in Asia. Uh, FA Chair Lahti had told that the Nordic delegation will ask questions from the Qatari Organizing Committee about the violations of human and labor rights for migrant workers. However, Qatari media, Qatari media released a story and photographs where Mr. Lahti, the president, and his local colleague smiled together in the ballroom. Here's the photo. And very few people in Finland thought that the chairman was sincere with his comments about the situation in Qatar because of this, that media stuff. And what happened after the training camp? As the head coach, Canelo, selected players to the next matches against Italy and Armenia, Rigorinsky's name was not on the list. There was no public cry about his absence. However, as Rinsky has been so-called fringe player and not regular face in the national team. Uh, himself, uh, he wasn't disappoint disappointed, but he hoped that the discussion around the circumstances in Qatar will continue in Finland and in, in elsewhere as well. Inside the FA of Finland, follow with a little discussion on the episode. A subcommittee took a firm stance against similar training camps in the future. And then the Council of the Finnish Association, Association of Football had a long debate on the issue as well. And the Council decided to consult the Finnish Centre for the Integrity in Sports about the case. <laughs> And this, a couple of months later, this organization, FINSIS, the integrity uh, organization, gave guidelines not only to uh, football federation, but to all sport federations in Finland regarding the circumstances in a country where a team is going to have a training camp. 
The sports federations should pay attention to human rights aspects as they choose training camp sites. So, we are now in October and Finland is already thinking about the next uh, training camps in January 2020. And according to the president, Mr. Lahti, Qatar is still one alternative. But, well, we take into consideration the guidelines drawn by the FinSEC, the integrity organization. We don't know yet if the FAF really accepted exact criteria. The FAF have not told about the details and how the selection of the next winter training camp location will proceed. Probably the guidelines are loose, which means that the FAF have a possibility to interpret them according to the current situation. And the most recent episode on this case uh, happened some three, three weeks ago when the greatest uh, Finnish soccer player of all time, Jari Litmanen, who has a ground uh, in Ajax, Barcelona, Liverpool, and so on, is the winner of the Champion League uh, from year 1995. He visited Doha in, in September and braced later on to 12th uh, uh, 2022 tournament and quote, Qatar 2022 will not disappoint anybody. In Finland, media and fan reaction was furious. Even Litmanen had a nickname, King. Litmanen's role as a Qatar World Cup ambassador was condemned generally by journalists and football fans as well. After the Lippmann case, the Finnish National Team Supporters Association expressed the wish that the National Team will stay away from Qatar in the future. They told one week ago to the media and to the uh, Football Association that keep in mind human rights aspect and don't go to Qatar in January 2020. And the last picture. The guy on the left is Mr. Saudi, the old president, and maybe you know the other guy as well. And they met some three, three weeks ago, which was quite funny happening, as always, with Mr. Trump. Mr. Minister was the president of the Finnish Football Association in 1910 uh, when Qatar cut the games. Uh, he couldn't vote because it was FIFA Council who made the decision, not the Congress. But Mr. Minister didn't like the uh, way the voting was proceeded, and he was one of the uh, leaders who wanted to change the voting system. And he's is still uh, appreciated for that uh, case. Thank you very much. Next up is Todd Frelek, who will talk about uh, Colin Kaepernick and sport as activist community. <coughs> Thank you very much. I my slides, slides will show up. Um, it's my first time to play the game, and I've really enjoyed um, the conference the last few days. I was telling one of the panelists, it's different than a traditional academic conference, and the, uh, the value of just having conversations across different disciplines and different backgrounds has been great. So I look forward to continuing that here in this session today. Um, I also know when you look up here, you see Kaepernick's name, and I know since I submitted this, I'm going to use that as a case study. We could pull that out and you could slide into that, the Me Too movement, the Equal Pay movement. There's a lot of different opportunities and things to talk about regarding. Uh, the activist community that athletes currently find themselves in. 
This is also something that is sort of new to me. I was at a conference last year in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and a football player for the University of Tulsa was a sophomore, and he gave a presentation called The Importance of Student-Athlete Community Activism, The Power of Being More Than an Athlete. And I think that really is something I should have been thinking about as a, as a faculty member and someone who works with young people and with students and student-athletes. But that really sort of pushed this to the forefront and has encouraged me to think about some things. And what I'll talk about today is sort of the history of athlete activism, where we are today and what makes this era maybe unique, um, the role of social media in um, athlete activism, and the role or the importance of the sense of community. And that's really what I want to focus on today. And I'll promise to stay within 10 minutes. And I'll hopefully do this correctly too. Cool. So as I was thinking about this presentation, I want to make sure we had sort of a context and a history of, where, of athlete activism. And I was familiar with this picture, hopefully you all are as well. This is Muhammad Ali um, when he was refusing um, to participate in the draft in the 60s. And what I was unaware of is that a lot of scholars refer to this as the pinnacle of athlete activism. Um, you have this in the late, the late 60s. You also have um, the protests at the Olympics. Um, and those are iconic images of athlete activism. And then what I've also sort of realized in doing this is, is through the 80s and through the mid-2000s, we all sort of had what some scholars are calling sort of a, a chilling effect. We were not seeing the same visibility of athletes um, participating in activism. Not to say that they weren't, but it was sort of removed from the forefront. Um, and I think also, we'll come back to this later, it's just not so much that this was Ali, but if you look closely or if you look through a different lens, this is a community. He was supported by a community of people who agreed that he should be able to participate and his voice was powerful. But 50 years later since this picture, athletes are again taking a political stand and gaining visibility as, as activists. And so as we move through this, two terms that are, that are pretty critical um, for this conversation. One is activism. That can be defined in a lot of different ways. We can agree and disagree on that. Two things that for, for the purposes of what I'm going to talk about, um, activism should express specific demands for social change. It should operate in tandem with broader social movements. Um, Ali was a part of the civil rights movement. That was that era. We now have the Black Lives Matter movement. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Also connecting activism to sports specifically. Um, uh, again, as research has shown, sport allows us to see larger political alliances um, and solidarities in, in useful ways. And that's something over the last few days I've seen come up in multiple um, different presentations and sessions. And then community. It sounds like a word that's pretty basic. We all know what community is, but really thinking about it as a way that we have a feeling of fellowship, um, common attitudes, and goals. And that is essential when you are an activist to make sure you can move forward, that there's other people who agree with you and are there to support you. And again, just a little more context for the area that we're in. Not to say that it disappeared um, over the last few years, but just to show that it has continued, but also to really make sure we're aware of the backlash that happens instantly. When athletes step out of their arena where people feel like that's where they belong, um, and so just in this picture we have sort of uh, some different images of the historic um, moments of, of athlete activism um, over time. Even to, you know, um, in the bottom, which I guess would be your left-hand corner, Mahmoud Abdul Raouf, quietly praying during the national anthem during the NBA. Um, that was in, in the mid to late 90s. And he basically from that moment on disappeared from that league. If he did this today, how would that look a little bit different? And so the backlash becomes pretty essential to this conversation um, and, and will make more sense hopefully when we get to, to Kaepernick as a, as a case study. Because where we are today, you have people telling these athletes, I mean, in public, in the public arena, shut up and dribble. You know, LeBron, that's who you are. That's what you're, you're paid to do. We don't want to hear anything else about you. Um, these athletes become isolated, their efforts are diminished, um, they're disconnected from larger social movements, which makes it much easier to sort of disregard what they're saying, to remove their voices from the, the public, public arena, the public sphere. They become undermined, and they're often treated like outliers. Um, again, you've got um, John Carlos and, and Tommy Smith, and they were removed from the Olympic Games, and really talked about in a way that, that removed them from the larger social conversation at the time, which makes it much easier to dismiss that conversation. But what we're seeing today, I think, is a connection directly to some other larger social movements and some larger conversations about police brutality or racial injustices that are occurring, and athletes are, are connecting themselves with those larger social movements. 
And that specifically gets us to the Black Lives Matter movement. And again, we could play on the equal pay movement with the women's national team or the Me Too movement with what's, what occurred with um, gymnastics recently. But here again, just some images which I think allow us to see these people not as outliers, not as individuals, but as groups of people connected to a community. Um, whether that's the NBA players, the NFL players, whether you've got the, the St. Louis Rams walking out, hands up, don't shoot, um, in, in St. Louis after the, the instances in Ferguson. And again, they're totally aware of, there's consequences to that. That could impact their livelihood, that could impact just their day-to-day -day lives. Um, also making sure we're aware of this is not just professional athletes. And again, this is a specific focus on the U.S. Um, up here in the left-hand corner, that's the University of Missouri football team. They basically told administration, we're not going to play unless you take seriously the issues and the conversations that our, that our campus colleagues, other students are having about a strike against racism on our campus. You know, think about being 19, 20, 21 years old and everything you do is based around, you're an athlete, we're paying you to go to school, here's your scholarship. And they took a stand that had some real consequences for them, but also had a, an impact. And again, I think they were able to do that because of this connection to a, to a larger community. And, and so that gets me to, to Kaepernick. And here is, hopefully you've seen this picture and you're aware of he started out, um, he took a seat first. Someone noticed it. He'd been doing it for a few weeks. It caught someone's attention. Um, he argued that I'm going to do this quietly. This is just my way of showing my support um, or my bringing attention to injust um, and oppression of people of color, police brutality, and that went viral. Um, he later took a knee when he had conversations with individuals who said that might show a little more respect for the flag. He said, you know what, I'll do that. The people he talked to might have disagreed with him, but, but he was willing to have those conversations and, and that's what's missing. And this is where we get to this notion of community. How did this one specific act, how does it create community, does it create community? To do that, we have to understand the research has documented that sport does create community. It creates community within the athletic arena, it creates uh, within participants. The last few days being here, I mean, it's just reaffirmed for me that that's what sport does and that's one of the positives. Um, and this sense of community is beneficial because it, it, it has been shown to increase your well-being as an individual when you feel like you belong to larger organizations, and it also increases civic participation. So we're seeing these athletes who see direct connections to larger social issues and larger the, the politi current political landscape, and so they're connecting themselves to that. And I think it gives them the courage, the support, and the resources to continue. Um, uh, NFL player responded to, to Kaepernick's taking a knee by basically saying, we have a responsibility to come together collectively and support these efforts. He cannot do this on his own. It will be dismissed. <coughs> I'm not going to say that social media is going to solve everything and that social media is the reason that activists are more beneficial or are more successful today, but I do believe we can all agree that there are some definite benefits to social media and activists and athlete activists are finding ways to use that. Um, two things that I've highlighted here because I think they're relevant to the conversation is one, it does create a symbolic construction of a sense of togetherness, um, and we'll see that in a minute with Kaepernick. And it also does allow people to overcome sort of this sense of maybe isolation and seclusion. And for athletes, it also gives them an opportunity to talk and have conversations with people that otherwise they would rely on face to face. So how can I have a larger conversation? How can I engage in a larger conversation with people on a global um, scale or even fans who otherwise they would not meet or other athletes, those kind of things. And so social media has created that context or further the ability to have those conversations. And so I think, again, with the Kaepernick instance, it does provide us with an example of how community was created very quickly. Um, he started out sitting, he took a knee, and then you can see here on this slide how many people responded right away. He did not send an email to those people. He did not call them and say, hey, support me. This occurred. Social media created this event, connecting it to the larger Black Lives Matter movement was critical. Um, and it has encouraged and generated initial or continued conversations about um, these important issues. And I've got a little less than a minute, so I'm going to get to this quickly. But that gets me back to this notion of I am more than an athlete. This was a sign that was posted on LeBron's website, and it has gone viral. Uh, people are now talking about it online as it's a rallying cry. 
for athletes across social media. Um, it started in 2018 and is fostering community. There, there's a video that you can go online and look at it and has all these athletes talking about what it means to be a part of, part of a community. And so just to end quickly, I do feel like we're seeing an activist community within athletics. Um, Bell Hooks reminds us that marginality can be the site of radical possibility. Many of these athletes do find themselves, um, their identities are those that are traditionally marginalized. In my world of academics, things become validated when we feel like it's legitimate to write about it. And this is just an example of a journal recently saying, this is what's happening, let's investigate, let's talk about it, let's move forward and figure out how is this, how is this occurring. Um, again, this was for me a focus on US, but I do look forward to continued conversations about how is this same thing occurring on an international scale um, and other examples that can help us understand the importance of community in sports and, and, and activists. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Todd. Uh, Todd, you have the um, I'm actually going to, that was wonderful, Todd, thank you, because I'm going to actually take a little bit of an international um, look at what we're talking about, and I will talk about Hakeem in a minute. <clears throat> um, so I'm an Olympic swimmer and a human rights lawyer. I recently founded two organizations that are going to hopefully take this community and create this community that you've talked about. Um, the first one, athlete activist. In order for athletes to actually become activists, we need to secure their human rights. So first and foremost, in the international sporting community, this is what we have to do. Only then can we amplify their voice so that they can actually stand up uh, for the human rights that are connected to the sporting movement. Lex Athletica is sort of the legal entity that will help support that. Um, so much we heard this week about athletes not having access to legal resources and the goal of Lex Athletica will to become that um, pro bono house, clearing house. Although I've been coming to play the game for 15 years now, um, uh, I think my activism really kicked off in 2008 when I was part of the um, athlete troublemakers um, that were around the Beijing 2008 Olympics. I was part of Team Darfur. Um, I won't go into, uh, uh, basically, we had visas revoked, we had athletes that were um, threatened that if they didn't remove their name um, from our website, that they would not be allowed to go to the Olympic Games. And I just wanted to highlight the difference between how um, then presidential candidate Barack Obama um, alluded to us, which was in a very positive light, while IOC member Dick Pound told us to shut up or go home. Um, these are two of probably the um, my um, top athlete activists of the year. In international human rights law, we would call them human rights defenders. Um, but as I said at the beginning, we athlete activists cannot be human rights defenders until we secure their human rights. And we'll talk a little bit about the difference between these two, the contrast between how they experience their human rights based on um, where they lived and the organizations that govern their sport. Um, so I'm sure everyone in this room has heard of Hakeem al Arabi's case. He was one of 150 athletes that were specifically targeted during the Arab Spring by the Bahrain um, Olympic Committee. Um, Prince Nasser, who's the head of the Bahrain Olympic Committee, specifically ordered a committee formed to target athletes and wade through video of protests, peaceful protests, um, so that they could haul those sports people in and um, many of whom were arrested and tortured, Hakeem being one of them. Uh, fortunately for Hakim, he was able to flee Bahrain um, and he landed in Australia where he was granted refugee protection. During that time when he was protected, um, he spoke out against um, uh, Prince Nasir's uh, cousin, uh, Sheikh Salman, who we've heard a lot about this week. Sheikh Salman was running for the FIFA presidency and Hakim came out in the New York Times saying that he would not make a good candidate because of the human rights record in Bahrain. Um, in retaliation, he was unlawfully detained in Thailand when he was heading there on his honeymoon, uh, even though he still had refugee protection status. Um, and it was only after a global movement of activists that Hakim was finally released. You compare that to Megan Rapino, um, who, uh, who had a very different experience. Being based in the United States, uh, where freedom of speech is uh, protected much more strongly than in the rest of the world. Although I did want to highlight the difference in how um, she was treated by two different bodies. So USA Soccer, which comes under the Olympic movement, 
um, talked about when they changed their anthem rule um, to stop her from kneeling, they talked about um, it's a time for athletes to reflect on their liberties and freedom. Mm -hmm. Not to realize them, just to reflect upon them. Um, whereas um, the MLS, which has a union supporting it, um, they actually um, went, up, went out to talk about respect for and support for the right to express personal beliefs. So a really powerful difference there, um, even for Megan Rapino in the United States. Um, so briefly, we, you know, the ones that I'm going to talk about today are freedom of expression um, and freedom of assembly connected with that. Freedom from abuse I won't talk about today, but I think it's certainly something that has come up obviously this year. Um, and due process rights more generally. Um, I actually, I used to always show the pictures of um, the gentleman from Mexico City. I've actually found two women who um, were activists before, um, Carlos and Smith. Um, Rose Robinson is, is um, documented as, as the first athlete, athlete activist in the podium protest. Unfortunately, she's not famous because I don't think there's a picture. She sat on the podium at the 1959 Pan American Games in order to protest America's involvement in the Vietnam War, as well as civil, early civil rights. And then um, teammates of Carlos and Smith, um, Wyomia Tyus, she actually is running in black shorts, which was not the kit. It was supposed to be blue shorts, and so she had a silent protest. Um, but you know, this I'm also putting on this slide uh, the international law regarding freedom of expression, which is generally accepted norms from um, the international community as well as most democratic nations. Under international law, we also have an obligation to specifically help minority groups. Um, and in this case, under the um, Racial Discrimination Convention, um, racial and ethnic minorities are supposed to be given extra assistance in expressing their views. Um, these are two totally different experiences, and I think Todd alluded to the changes that have been happening in the world. We used to be a little bit more open. Kathy Freeman was the star of the 2000 Sydney Olympics. She won gold for Australia. She was able to run with, I think, no um, consequences around the track with both flags, the Aboriginal and Australian flag. But when Damien um, Hooper uh, did this at the 2012 Olympics, he was forced to apologize by the Australian Olympic Committee. Now, in Australia, both flags are recognized as official flags. So I think it's horrendous that this gentleman was forced to apologize for um, uh, wearing an Aboriginal flag t-shirt. Under the Women's Convention, we also have specific measures that must be put in place to protect female, uh, to empower women, um, and I think the sporting movement has those. Um, other ways that athletes can, we, we're gonna talk about a lot of podium protests, obviously they're pretty hot topics, but you know, Venus Williams penned an op-ed around pay equity. Um, Ada Hedgeberg um, actually sat out for pay equity. Um, this is one of my favorites. I found Yale women stripped naked in 1969 to protest the fact that their crew team didn't have um, showers. And then um, we all know Catherine Schweitzer, who was the first woman to try to break into the Boston Marathon. Now, the Olympic ideals sound like they would protect all these rights. There's lots of um, language in the Olympic Charter. We heard some of the IOC members this week allude to all the wonderful things that the Olympic movement can bring. Um, there's even non-discrimination clause in the Olympic Charter. Despite this, the IOC directly curtails athlete rights of freedom and expression in Olympic Charter Rule 50.2. Now the thing that I, I actually am working on an argument that none of this that the athletes have been doing is propaganda, and I will make that argument this year so that athletes can feel safe that they can make these statements because propaganda has a specific definition and I don't think standing up for racial injustice or LGBT rights is propaganda. Um, however, the problem is the, um, the overt um, penalty, like the, the intimidation in the consequences. So all of these decisions are gonna be left up to the executive board of the Olympic Committee um, to decide if there is an athlete protest on the podium or anywhere in the Olympic venues, um, the, this, these are the threats, temporary or permanent ineligibility. They can take your medals away and impose financial sanctions. So there's huge consequences, and this is where the due process part is a problematic. Some of the rules have not been applied consistently. Um, this gentleman, um, whose name I'm not gonna be able to pronounce, so uh, is an Ethiopian. After he won a medal in Rio, he made a, a cross 
um, which is the Oromo peoples. That was a protest um, symbol that they used. Um, my understanding is he was not penalized in any way for doing that. Um, he tried to seek asylum and or was in exile for several years before returning to Ethiopia. Ahead of the Rio Olympics, Thomas Bach did back down a little bit on some of this and said that athletes could speak up in press conferences. Simone Manuel was the first African-American woman uh, to win gold in the pool, and she took advantage of that and spoke up in the press conference about what it meant for her to be the first African-American woman to win gold. This is not just happening at the Olympics. Um, on the, uh, there's a Swedish um, high jumper who at the World Track and Field Championships um, painted her nails rainbow color in Moscow to protest LGBT rights. Um, we recently saw Mac Horton protest anti-doping issues at the Swimming World Championships. Within, like overnight, his case was um, that the FINA had an executive meeting at the championships and made that um, unlawful what he did earlier in the competition. Pan American Games, we saw two athletes um, do different protests on the podium. The US Olympic Committee came down hard on them and has made threats um, as to if they do this in Tokyo, there will be consequences. What we need, so this is my last slide, I see five seconds. Um, we, need our athlete, we need our human rights secured. So we need to end Rule 50.2. Um, we need explicit support for freedom of speech, association, and due process that's outlined in the Olympic Charter. We need to end the autonomy of sport. I really cannot wait for external actors to engage more, more, um, uh, more realistically in, the, in sport. We need to have domestic and international oversight, sport governing bodies. We need external sports governance um, uh, we, need, we need reform from the outside. I'm sick of hearing about IOC's internal reforms. We need due process implementation. We need effective remedial me um, mechanism. And we need financial support. All of this athlete activism cannot happen without any financial support. We heard from Han earlier this week how little money he's given to run all of the athletes in the United States to try and bring them together to hear their voice um, I believe that in Germany there is funding given by the, the government, correct me, which is what we need. We need the governments of our country to be giving us money to be able to do this. We cannot rely on sports um, who do not want to give us money. We need administration money to be able to make effective change. Um, and the last thing we obviously need is true consultation and capacity building. Um, we need to end forced you know, signing of athlete agreements and we need financial support and training um, so that we can be active um, leaders in this um, movement. Thank you. And our final speaker is Margaret slides, I will start anyways. I was going to say good morning in my notes, but I realize it's now good afternoon since the session has moved along. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the land uh, within, on, on top that we are working on today of, of the UT peoples. Uh, I'd like to thank the hosts of Play the Game, uh, this organization for a fantastic exchange across many different uh, organizations and, and perspectives. And, and thank you, Chair, for, for doing this today, Paulina. Um, so there is a really long and very uneven history of athletes being able to use their voices, their bodies, and their fists for social activism. Um, and throughout all of the different generations of uh, athlete activists, there have been a variety of different media platforms that have been deployed over the past century, probably even, uh, obviously even earlier than that, to get access to sport, to get change within sport, to get social justice in and beyond sport. So some of the things that I would like to talk to you about today, uh, sorry, I hope the purple can be read back then. Um, I want to talk about some of the transformations that have happened between media 1.0 to 2 to 3 that we is approaching us now. The waves of different media activism that have occurred uh, throughout um, how the media has changed. 
and to revisit the sport media complex uh, in order to rethink not just the audience as the commodity for the sport media complex, but the athlete as well, and to remind us that the athlete is the raw material, so they're obviously very underfunded for what is produced out of this sport media complex. Athletes have become what are called producers. That's not a spelling mistake. Uh, the, that notion of they are both uh, a user of the media and a, pro a production person, so a producer. Um, and then we have seen recently the emergence of the possibilities of athlete-owned media or even activist-owned media and the possibilities for what that might mean for uh, a buzzword out in a number of fields, alt-globalism, alternative forms of globalism. I'd rather talk about more kind of transnational forms of, of markets that can happen in and around sports that are not necessarily uh, the types of exchanges that might abuse the people uh, who are uh, working and living in and around there. So if we have time, I might talk about some of the emerging issues of symbolic thickening and how that might exacerbate racism. Uh, and the really big issues that I think will happen if we move towards Media 3.0, where we have um, uh, artificial intelligence coming together with what they call machine learning to make decisions and how that affects privacy and, and cybersecurity. And finish with some recommendations. I don't have the magic touch today. <laughs> okay, so just very briefly, when um, talking about the difference between um, these different sections, Media 1.0 is very static. It's your newspapers, it's your website that just lists what you're doing. So it's really just an info dump. Uh, it can be used for activism to get some ideas going. Media 2.0 is much more interactive. Uh, and it's producerly because uh, not just formal people working in the media, but people that have their cell phones can, uh, can produce ideas, can exchange them. Media 3.0 from the tech industry's perspective is where we bring together um, what they're calling, uh, or calling an intelligent net, but that's where all the information that's been gathered about you begins to help your technology make decisions about the next information you. We're seeing that already uh, to some degree, um, but it could take on bigger implications because sport analytics is really exciting to a lot of different areas of sports science. And we have this sense that somehow it's the machines making the decisions rather than looking at the assumptions. There can be racist categories, gendered categories that are built already into the assumptions of how information is gathered. Thank you. So, Waves of Athlete Activism. I had to get Bruce up there. One of the first books ever written, uh, Bruce King and, and Mary, uh, Mary Ebert's on athletes' rights uh, in my country. Um, but the waves of, uh, of activism uh, have occurred in a number of ways. 1924 Olympics were about to happen, and they didn't offer any women's track and field events. So a French woman, Alice Smith, organized the Jeux Olympics Feminine in 1922. They nicknamed the Women's Olympics, but they deployed telegraph letter writing, print media, to attract women to argue that they should have their own games, uh, and they did pull it off, uh, even though the newspapers were calling them girls. Um, but, um, so media has all often been used to create alternative forms of activity when there have been some major barriers. Still, two, sorry, 1.0, books, petitions, letter writings, and advocacy could be the, the earlier generation uh, in the 1960s and 70s. Here we have pioneer Dr. Bruce Kidd, who is with us today. He might be hiding behind somebody back there. Uh, but an interesting photo, what a gem I found, of him in the hospital, reading Marx, that's media 1.0, uh, typing a protest while waiting for surgery so he could come back to sport. Uh, but always been someone who combined human rights with the right to health, the right to work, uh, the right to be educated, the right to all the basic human rights. Um, there's been other ways. Media is not just our technology that we see today. Any medium of communication can be used for protest. Uh, this is, for those of you who don't know uh, this history, this is Alwyn Morris, who in 1984 went to the Olympics, became a gold medalist in sprint kayaking. Alwyn Morris is using this as a media communication um, to communicate both about Team Canada and about his Mohawk Nation. 
He did uh, say that he raised it primarily to honor his grandfather, um, and then to celebrate the victory with indigenous peoples across uh, all of uh, Turtle Island, and then to share his identity with Canadians. But that became uh, a springboard for uh, helping to develop the Aboriginal Sports Circle, to become a policy advisor with Indigenous land rights. So sport can, be, can become, it's not just that sport reflects what's going on in society, it can become a place uh, where athlete activism can take its places. Simon Whitfield is one of uh, uh, the best examples I can think of uh, in the early years of Media 2.0, where you had your internet, you had your uh, emails, where you could begin to tweet and have that exchange and a dialogue and be a media force onto yourself. At the 2000 Olympics, he was the first ever athlete to win gold in triathlon. But come 2012, he's at the Games in London, and is really upset with how a uh, Canadian runner was, or sorry, got dry throat, triathlete was being uh, treated uh, in terms of running, being injured. Um, and uh, because he tweeted out his big concerns, and you should be able to raise your health concerns um, to the media, to the people around you, um, as long as you are, are not, make, it's not misinformation, um, it's important that uh, our voices don't get silenced out there. Um, so he has been fighting, uh, he had been fighting a, a defamation suit uh, slapped on because he had critiqued uh, and criticized the triathlon coach quite, uh, quite openly and as well some of the other physicians. It's important to speak, speak up for human rights and the right to expression should never be stifled um, for any reason, particularly those ones that are protected like health. <coughs> the sport media complex. So, such, such Jolly uh, was the guy who introduced this to us to remind us that the sport, the media, the sport organizations, the media, and the sponsors are symbolically, symbiotically linked. They need each other to produce the incredible products uh, of sport, the fascinating stuff that goes on. But the audience is actually the commodity within his version. I think as we've moved on, we've needed to say, well, there's a whole cycle of cultural production around there. And all of these key points don't just have separate jobs, but they're all producing ideas about sport. They're all producing dominant discourses about sport. They are, sorry, get this going again. They're distributing, circulating those ideas, enhancing the power of it, uh, and consuming. But what's happened in recent years as we've begun to move into um, the social media era, that there are producers that take away from some of the, the power of that media. And I think we have a real opportunity to keep thinking about how has the athlete become a commodity and how can uh, instead us move them to thinking about them as producers. They produce that incredible athletic performance, but they're also a part of the media. And to not, with all those new social media guidelines at the Olympic Games, athletes have already signed away their rights to expression for a lot of years, and now it's getting even tighter with the social media. Um, so we do have the possibility of producers. This week, the second I arrived in my hotel room, oh, I was so excited to see Simone um, Simone Biles uh, finish off the uh, international championships in gymnastics and pull off a couple of new moves. Uh, but that also brings up some new rights issues as well. The emergence of new digital media has brought issues of health and representation, ownership of image, of image, fears of retribution if you're going to be sued for tweeting out something, trolling, online harassment, battles, and now the latest battle is not just owning your own move, so they've called uh, that, what was it, the triple double, triple, triple twist, double, like just phenomenal human movement. Um, this athlete, the, it's named after her, but the push towards higher and higher levels and how much that's worth in gymnastics is a health discussion we need to have. So the media gets all excited about these new moves, but then when it's worth very little, you're starting to put the athlete on the line even more. So I'm not even going to get through my presentation, I'll just keep going. Um, sorry, I'll, I'll put forward. Um, so we do have athletes that are beginning to uh, raise their voices, um, and now we have athletes that have even changed, they said, you know what, we're going to change the meaning of what it means to have a media blackout. In the past it meant that the local team had power to say the media can't be there, so that you have to pay to come to the games. 
Um, but the, uh, the Washington uh, team, the Mystics, when they won the championship last year and before, they just said, we're going to have a media blackout. We're not talking about sport to the media. If we have an issue that you guys are ignoring, whether it's sexism, racism, um, they will um, use that time to do it. So we do have the possibility now for athlete-owned media. Uh, and ironically, uh, I'll, I would, I would um, talk about LeBron's very differently uh, three days ago than today. But, but a really good example is Burn It Down. It's a combination of women from both sides of, of the 49th parallel. Women from the United States and Canada who are, are podcasting, who are telling stories that aren't being told, who are using those platforms uh, to change. So in moving forward, I think what we need to do is to think about collectivist human rights, to have a commitment to the rigorous scrutiny. And I'll just finish off with this slide. So my recommendations are in all that we do with media studies, with athlete studies, with human rights studies, I think we have to keep pushing for those collectivist uh, human rights. We need to be... Um, Imagining our sporting, our sporting imaginations that take all those individual troubles and give people a forum to take them to public issues. I think I will end it there because we can probably pick up on a lot of these. So thank you for listening. And thank you, Margaret. Um, thank you to all speakers for the very interesting presentation. I am sure, I know you, each of you will be able to speak for about an hour or more about those issues, but I think uh, now we will move on to also very interesting parts, the debate with the public. Um, so I already see there is one question here in the back and then here in the front. Nikki, you uh, brought up the Pan Am Games protest and the suspension that happened after that and then the uh, US Olympic Committee warned athletes about similar behavior in Tokyo. And then two weeks later announced John Carlos and Tommy Smith are going to be inducted in the Hall of Fame. Can anybody explain that to me? Yeah. You know, so my argument is that they're being pressured by the International Olympic Committee. And I think what we need to be doing is having our national government. So they're also complicit in this, right? So under international law, the UN guiding principles on human rights and business, um, nation states have the right like the duties to protect human rights, and they do have citizen athletes. I took that slide out, but really what's happening here is that this international organization, the IOC, is forcing governments to violate their own laws. So the IOC is gonna force the USOC to violate what is a fundamental right in the United States to free speech. Um, this has happened in the past in Canada. The IOC forced Bannock to violate the human rights of women ski jumpers. Um, so this is something that's a, that's a theme with the IOC, forcing nation states with good human rights records to violate the rights of athletes. And so I think that this is uh, it coming directly from, and it's happening in every country, not just the United States, but I think in the United States where freedom of expression is literally the most important thing in the whole world, um, we should be fighting against this and have a much uh, better argument. It's really, really disappointing, the USOC's position on this. Is this working? I think so. Hello? It's working now. Okay. Uh, yeah, Marcus Soy, I, I not only work for Bloomberg, but I'm working for Play the Game at this conference. Uh, I was interested to hear um, Margaret say that the right to free expression should never be stifled for any reason. Um, and my, my question, perhaps Nikki might be able to uh, comment on this, and, and Margaret too, but all the panel. Uh, how far should we support the right to protest? Like, should it only be the causes related to human rights or maybe more fashionable causes such as Me Too or Black Lives Matter? Uh, or, or should it be other causes that are perhaps less popular that don't enjoy uh, real popular support? Last week, Turkish footballers saluted um, b before a game. They, they, they gave a salute to, to show their support for the Turkish uh, army's invasion of Kurdistan. Um, so what about causes like this? What about causes with entrenched views on both sides, like um, Palestinian freedom, for example? Uh, how, how far should we support the right to protest, I guess is my question. Who would like to jump on this? I'm happy to start. So I, I think that um, 
you know, every country has slightly different interpretations of how far free speech goes. And so I learned that by growing up in Canada, where free speech is based on peace, order, and good governance, to moving to the United States, where obviously it's a very different interpretation of how far free speech can go. You know, my personal litmus test is does the speech um, incite uh, violence? Um, and so, but you know, it is a judgment call. Um, but I think. I would not be able to stand, sit up here and talk about the right to freedom of expression and then turn around and say some people don't have that right. Um, I think traditionally in the Olympic movement, we've seen athletes be very free to be able to um, represent their religious ideology. Um, there's athletes that wear crosses, um, kiss the cross and hang the cross. Um, so Christianity has been welcomed in the Olympic movement um, and I would love to see athletes of different religions be able to express that as well. Is this working? Um, I, I'm going to take a different tack because I think that was that was just brilliantly answered in terms of that link between expression and where and protests. Um, I think in the past when we've studied athletes' rights and their relationships with the media, um, when Canadian athletes, for example, know that they have the right to free expression, I think the bigger problem is not knowing what other things mean, like off the record. And so in this era of social media, I think a lot of, of uh, people that have not, that are not aware of the law, that are not aware of, of, um, of, of what are some of the limitations on, on speech, like hate speech or, or, or making a lie. We had a number of athletes in one survey that believed they could tell a lie and that the journalists would protect them because they'd seen that a lot on television. So if they wanted to get their, their coach fired. Um, so that, that right to free expression also comes with responsibilities. And I think um, that's something that I would like to have percolating amongst the athletes when they're thinking about um, their activism. Thank you. Todd, would you like to add something to that question? Let's um, um, No, sorry, there was a gentleman back there who was uh, before you in the, in the line. A question to anyone in the panel that might share to answer. We have heard here uh, comments from official representatives of athletes, whether it's in the IOC or USFC, about their role and their earnest efforts. Of course, I will never believe that going through official channels, leaving that as the only uh, method for athletes, is going to be adequate. So I think we really need to go out our way to both support athletes and groups who want to come forward, whether it's for the, the issues involved, uh, related to what they are involved with in sports or societal issues. But then I've heard, even here in this room, earlier in the week, comments like from NCAA, oh well, they should be grateful for these uh, very expensive uh, scholarships, so they should really be quiet. And of course they hear the same comments from and NFL team owners all the time. And I think that, that sort of, it goes beyond that. I think in society generally, strangely in this day and age when protest movements are almost so common that you get overwhelmed or confused at times, but that they are taken for granted and accepted, that somehow athletes are, are the ones least entitled to use their particular public uh, awareness or knowledge or uh, uh, to uh, uh, either discuss their own situation or other topics. And to me the question therefore is, if that's the case, what can one do apart from supporting them in their effort? What can one do to get the general public to, to change that mindset that they seem to have and really understand that this is totally legitimate, useful and necessary? Again, um, one thing is to um, pop athletes out of their bubble, right? Because they're, you know, one of the things that happened when we all started having media training, it became very boring to be in a press conference. Um, media training was like the worst thing that happened to swimming. Um, and so, you know, you have athletes who are living in a bubble and, um, you know, their stories were all the same. And so I think one of the things is 
ending, again, ending sports exceptionalism, ending sport autonomy, where athletes and sports are allowed to exist separate and apart from the rest of society. We need to be able to connect athletes to the broader movements that they're part of. And this is what Todd was talking about in terms of community. I mean, this is so important to be connecting back to your community, understanding how you can better represent them. I was totally funded by the Canadian government and at the University of Florida. That's who paid for my swimming career. I have an obligation back to my, my people, the people who paid for my, my opportunities, um, to represent them and to, to help stand up for them. Um, but a lot of athletes just aren't, they're being trained and I say um, brainwashed in that the Olympic movement is enough. It's enough to be an Olympian and oh, just your existence in the Olympic movement is like the greatest thing in the whole world. Well, it's not. So I think we need to break out of our bubble and start interacting with, with the rest of the world. Nikki and I have never met before this week, but I have to apologize because I was the one that did the research on athletes' rights and relationships with the media, and the response by SWIM was to do media training. I didn't do the media training. <laughs> I, I, gave, I gave workshops on rights. Um, but one of it, so when you, you need to contextualize things. So when you look at an era where athletes are beginning to look for marketing, all of a sudden they would bring in older journalists that had retired and they would teach them how to give a pat answer, how to prepare, uh, and how to, and what, what we found when we did ethnographies behind the scenes at the Olympic Games with the swim team, <laughs> was was that they would be they would be taught really how to butter up the uh, the marketing people and I felt sorry for swimmers because they had to go to all these receptions right before they would go into the pool. Uh, so there's all these different levels of rights, but but that whole push towards marketing and making through the top program and the Canadian programs uh, that sport media complex. Um, the athletes, were they're the ones that generate all the money. They are the spectacular. But they don't have the right to be paid as they should. Um, so it's a complicated issue. But I keep wanting to get the training of the rights in there. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, um, to, your, to your question, that's sort of what started me even thinking about this, was to have a 19-year-old sophomore scholarship athlete at the university say, I'm more than an athlete. You know, and then I think it is it Alex or I was in a session yesterday where you were talking and it was like, how can I find ways where I am on a college campus to make other people aware of yes, they're more than athletes. These are our students, these are young people who are growing, who are who are just going through changes. And so what are some things I can do in that space to sort of reinforce this notion? And that could be something as simple as when a, a football player at my university and we're having a conversation in class on media and culture act says, you know, why am I wearing a flag on my uniform? And when they go to the administration about that, that conversation gets shut down. But letting that young person know it's okay to have, let's have that conversation and understand why. And if you don't want to, what are your rights? What are your resources? Those types of things. So I, it's not an easy answer, but I think that's your question is what sort of got me initially interested in this is what can I do to help people understand that they are more than, than athletes. We only have a few minutes left, so I'll just ask you to try to, to ask uh, short questions. Um, so, okay, we will have two more questions here. We will try to squeeze that in, and I think that we're gonna have to close the debate. So please, try concise questions, concise answers. So please go ahead. Oh. Well, I'm sorry, it's just not a question. So it's just a comment. Am I allowed to make it? No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great okay, freedom of expression. Right. Oh, you're right. You're right. Okay. I, I just want to go back to women's uh, ski jumping because I covered it as a journalist and, and uh, wrote for the Globe and Mail and uh, other newspapers in uh, Canada at the time. But when I res five years later, when I received a police report that it turns out that I was in, that coverage was seen by the uh, RCMP, National Police Force of Canada, as an example of my vendetta-like qualities towards men in power. And they repeated it for a full 17 months, 15 months, in, in, the, in a completely different so-called investigation. So when you are, and I was an athlete who couldn't go to the uh, Olympics because women's cycling wasn't in the Olympics when I raced, uh, 
uh, when you do have that voice, you should ask for the police records. Uh, so my name is Shuri Becker and I'm a researcher um, at the University of Bath. I just wanted to connect very quickly um, to the panel that we had last night at the training centre. And it struck me and a couple of other people um, in the room how when the panel were talking about the athlete development, development model, um, perhaps unintentionally they kept referring to medals rather than athletes. Um, so I just wanted to give uh, perhaps Todd and Nikki just a, an opportunity to comment on perhaps the connection to um, more than an athlete and to athlete activism um, in this culture of referring to athletes as medals or thinking about them as medals. Um, yeah, so I wasn't there, but that's very sad. Um, but I, th there's definitely a, a debate right now or we, where we do need more research, so if you are a researcher, on this idea that you cannot be a high performance athlete and still have athlete well-being. So I think we're starting to get to a point, the Golden State Warriors um, are probably an excellent example of a sports team that has embraced mindfulness and joy as their primary purpose, um, but we need more academic research to convince the old school sports establishment that athlete well-being is critical not only to the athletes of the future and the, that we want to create um, for our societies, but also that it can lead to high performance. Um, and so I, I think this all is, this is definitely all connected. Um, and you know, again, governments are paying for us to do this. What kind of person do you want to come out the other end? Do we want a totally destroyed athlete like we see most of the time? Or do we want a human being that's gonna positively contribute to society using this success and the, the, the journey that they've been on in sport to make the, the country that has paid for them um, you know, to, to make that a better place? Yeah, and I think also we just need to continue to see more examples. I know just sitting up here watching the other panels, the pre I'm writing down names of people who've done things who, as I look to start my research, like what's the history of activism and women who never even came up in my searches who did things that men did and they did it before and we weren't even aware of it. I think student athletes and high performing athletes need to see that there is a history that exists that they can be, continue to be a part of and then they see themselves as not just a medal or someone who's producing something. And that's a difficult process. Um, I mean, I was at a meeting earlier this week. My daughter's 13. She's looking to play um, volleyball. And so there's a local organization there. And we sat for an hour in this meeting on what it means to make this team. And I looked at uh, a friend of mine sitting next to me. I said, we've been in here for an hour. And they've not said the word fun one time. Like, so nowhere in that entire conversation, I think about how much fun are these young people going to have? It was all about if you do this, and pay this amount, you may get to hear. So that conversation needs to change, but as I learned last night, doing that on a national scale is extremely difficult. Um, so I think it's sort of multi-layered. Yeah, I saw that panel last night, and um, it, the comments about, we gotta make it really fun for kids, we gotta change the way we do our development, and we've gotta, because we need to produce metals. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that was quite explicit. Maybe that was the wrong place to think about child development, but I think we also have to critique child development itself because different areas of science use the notion of development very differently. And um, I think we need, to, we need to think about what does it mean to be an athlete versus a, just an active kid. And development programs don't necessarily mean, need to be for creating high performance kids. And we even have to be careful with how we talk about physical literacy because it really narrows. It's just like if you say, the way you pronounce your English is this way, is better than that. Um, we, can, we can also do that with body. There's a, a motor elitism that, that kind of goes throughout that development system um, that we need to think about all the possibilities of human repertoires of movement. Uh, and that's where kids are going to find joy uh, across many cultures. Thank you very much. I've got so many questions, but I'll only narrow it to one. I come at it from a regulatory lens. So I look at this as a, a form of regulation, how to alter and influence behaviours 
to modify behaviour to a design standard, to um, gather information and to set standards. So I'm really interested, Nikki, in your forward-focused approach to what you think might be needed in terms of if we look at this as a regulatory system, and I know North American forms of regulation looks really at the law and legislation, and I'm not advocating that view, I'm advocating the Julia Black view of regulatory theory, which is much broader, um, but to achieve a desired outcome. So I'm really interested in you know those mechanisms you're talking about in regard to how to um, include other actors that are not just the you know the sporting organisations that have the autonomy under a voluntary self-regulatory system with not many levels of transparency, accountability or checks and balances in a regulatory sense. So I'd be really interested to hear just who you think might be some of the key drivers because in non-sporting contexts we've certainly seen actors that have been very influential, peer group pressures, um, public interest groups that have been really great advocates for change. So just wondering what your thoughts are on that. That's such a great place to be in. Um, you know, I think um, the work that's being done in Germany with German athletes is an excellent example where the government is like supporting what you're doing in a way that's allowed you to access also the domestic courts. And I don't want to speak for you, but my understanding is that you know you've made great strides because you've been able to access things that have previously been not allowed for athletes. So you know, athletes are forced into this um, arbitration system. Um, you know totally forced. I mean, they're forced to sign 2,000 plus page athlete agreements um, that force them into arbitration. They don't have access to um, juristic, like other types of tribunals. Um, and so I think one big change would be that I know that the community of um, people working on these issues is talking about like, how can we recreate the um, grievance mechanisms in sport so that we aren't being forced into the arbitration so that athletes have an equal process in every country. Every country has a different system. And like, I didn't really realize that until I was like unpacking this, like ASADA anti-doping case in Australia and the, the way that the athlete goes through there is totally different than the way that would happen in Canada where we have our own tribunal in the UK that has their own tribunal and then the UK is doing like IAAF tribunal stuff. So it's just like every country has a different process. So what, what we really need is like a cohesive way that's not the CAS and um, is a better grievance mechanism that athletes are buying into. Athletes have a say in who is deciding our you know, legal destinies. Um, so I think, I don't know who those partners necessarily are though because um, you know, going into the just, I don't, I don't know, I think we need to create something new. I don't know if we have anyone. It's hard to jump into this discussion because there have been so many good and important ideas thrown out. I think we need a whole conference on the issues raised uh, by this conference. I put my hand up, Nikki, when you, uh, in, in uh, an effort to applaud your, uh, your effort to abolish 50.2 of the, um, the Olympic Charter. I think that's an important first step, and as, it, as you suggested in response to one of the questions, we need to revitalize, re-energize uh, the athletes' rights to speak out in responsible ways as part of the definition of what it's like to be an athlete, as part of what the Olympic ideal constitutes. And then we need to, and we were, Nikki and I and others were talking about whether we should reform or abolish the Olympics and we're still reformers. I think we need to resurrect the idea that the, the Olympics provides uh, an international intercultural form for the world. And in this crazy making, uh, oppressive world, I think the, the freedom of speech for everyone is such an important part to realizing that. And it's not just the athletes' rights, it's the citizens' rights against their host governments. Uh, it's uh, it's the, uh, the, the the journalists' rights who are not part of electron the electronic monopolies. Journalists who, who do not have uh, uh, employers who pay millions of dollars, so they're shut out. And so you've got privatized coverage of the Olympics. And then of course you've got the corporations who. Uh, have got uh, just uh, the loudest possible voice and legitimation. 
and, and they shut out the, the other protesters. I think we need to find a way to open up all of that uh, to be able to, to, to both enable responsible democratic criticism of all of the auspices of the games uh, and, uh, and to allow the kind of intercultural, interreligious uh, celebration that uh, the Olympics promised uh, to be. Um, I'm not sure where you start, and I know uh, the chair is saying this is not a question. I was about to say, uh, looking for a question mark. We've not only got to be able to protect <laughs> dialogue, but also open, open it up. Um, and one old idea is, uh, is an athlete's self-controlled Olympic channel uh, at every games. Another question or a comment, but those the members of the panel would like to would like to comment or add something before we close the debate. That was Bruce, everybody that was on the photos. Just in case everyone couldn't put that in that youthful, a youthful fi picture with uh, his current youthful picture. We do want to know what you were typing that day though. All right, all right. Well, Thank you very much for this interesting debate. Um, thank you for the panelists. Thank you also for the technical crew. Mm -hmm. It was very, very quick to solve our problems. Uh, thank you for the active participation. And now we go to lunch. A round of applause.